Good morning there, School of Tomorrow Lights. That's a mouthful, School of Tomorrow Lights, and it has that ites at the end, which connotes like kind of like a cult or a sect. If you're an ite of something, you're kind of a follower of something, right? I was going to take us to some Mennonites who look like Sufis here in my Facebook profile, but I wanted to stop and say this Cornell West YouTube was pretty fantastic, and while I'm mentioning YouTube, I should be popping that open here on my calculator of tomorrow, which sounds funny. It just means a laptop. Speaking of laptops, I still have the XO over there on the chair. That's the one laptop per child uh, specimen. I've done some YouTube on that. The idea in this channel is uh, where are we going with education? And I introduce a lot of material that you probably don't, you're probably wondering what, where's the cross checks? Like how can I omni triangulate? Like where's all the textbooks that talk about this? It's fine for me to go on and on and on. But so what? I'm just some guy on YouTube, right? So you cannot, in good conscience, even as a teacher, take this much further without seeing where there's corroborating sort of resonance in the culture. If there is any, right? That's the whole thing. Is there and why not? And, or is there? So that's kind of the theme right now for the next couple videos. It's a sociological issue. Uh, where is <clears throat> the Martian math I talk about? And if you're just joining us right now, the Oregon Curriculum Network is what I put together that I could fund with my own profits, right? So I plow all my profits back into Oregon Curriculum Network. And that, in turn, is what is behind this Martian math stuff. Which, when I'm doing gigs and working for companies, I don't just force my material into their curriculum. I might allude to it because I've found ways, for example, that I would use polyhedra to introduce object-oriented programming or programming in general. It's a great topic because you've got like a right brain going. You know, you've got the CAD. You've got your imagination. And that's why I've been pushing Blender. Now, the thing with Blender is I have it on a lightweight laptop on a different computer that doesn't have Camtasia. So, some of you have been looking around, poking around up through my videos to date, and I'm always into Blender, but where's, I don't show a whole lot of Blender, right? I just wanted to say that'll, as the computer picture changes, I might have more in-your-face Blender than I do right now. But I'm also looking at, you know, I have the same question everyone else does. Um, what else is going on out there around all this material? In other words, when I say this material, what do I even, even mean? I mean the concentric hierarchy of polyhedra. Let me get a better look at that. If you go in, you have to learn the secret. You know, it's like open sesame. It's like there is a secret. You click on that. You click on that. If you, you know, want to go in through the front door, you can just link to any of these pages. It's just the regular static web, web pages. Pretty much coded by hand. You have some ancient iconography here showing I had it checked against certain standards and so on. Everything that used to matter in that way. These are not generated out of like Django or Flask or anything. And you might be thinking, well, you're a Python teacher. Why isn't your website you know, but I'm keeping it kind of archaeological. I do occasionally fix a link or two, but really, this is where we were at, like in the 90s or something. But I want to go to um, what I would call the main page, which isn't really, you wouldn't know that looking at this. Where is it? Main topical outline? No, that's not it, but let's take a look. Bits and bytes, bases, right? So powers of two, see, I was a product of the new math. Powers of two, um, just two to the n, two to powers, and uh, 16, base 16, all that belongs together, lumped together with 
um, like here's this is just I'll just scroll through this and let me just say I've been using cardinality in a strange way not the way to, to, to rank the infinities is not the way I've been doing it and I think maybe I need to change it to nominality or something or nominal but it's like when you're naming things in a set but you have no order to them you know you just have a bunch of cats in a cat uh, pen and uh, they all have names but there's not a greater than less than sign maybe you know you can invent scenarios where they have ages and you can rank them you can give them an attribute whereby you would rank them but you admit to you know and, and then it makes a difference like when the buses buses are fascinating I'm talking about city buses because they have numbers used to just designate the route right 14 10 12 2 whatever those are bus routes and so it really doesn't make sense to say which is greater or whatever. They're kind of loops around the city that are enumerated. Kind of like we enumerate vertices and polyhedra and so forth. We're not saying which is the greater, greatest vertex. That would break the symmetry anyway. It's like an, it's an icosahedron. All the vertices are the same, that kind of thing. All the same. We don't sort them, is what I'm saying. So there's lots of times when we're working with sets that we're not sorting them is all I'm saying, nor do we in principle even have a way of sorting them. The complex numbers, we can again the attribute how far from the origin, but that's hardly unique. How do you even just sort uh, two-dimensional squares, right? It's, it becomes very complicated to, to impose sorting sometimes. So that's a whole topic and what I'm getting into, and of course it's much more developed than I say, you know, partial sorts, Sorting is just a phenomenally big topic, and I am not going to recreate the universe in my laptop here necessarily, but I am showing you that this whole website about math and stuff, it's pretty straightforward. You'll learn a lot from it, even if you're not interested at all. Here we go, programming language resources in this more obscure part of it. And here's that concentric hierarchy I was taking us to. It's a little blurry because it's kind of small. Let me not overdo it here. Um, <clears throat> now the whole thing about these is all the numbers, the, the volume numbers. And they're not all whole numbers. And there's no attempt to deny incommensurability and synergetics. That's core to it in some ways. Just like it is in reality. So... Anyway, the green cube, for example, is valued at 3 and so on. And you're very familiar with all this, and you're wondering if you've been following my channel, for example, and you're wondering, uh, okay, well, that's pretty. I've really gotten that. It's like I've watched 10 of your videos, and it's totally clear to me. I can think the concentric hierarchy, hierarchy inside and out. I know about A, B, T, E, S modules. What so... Okay, and it is part of American literature. It's embedded in history, and I've got the intellectual history stuff. But what of it? Where am I gonna? What am I gonna do with all this? You know, do I care that I understand these concepts now? And others of you are saying, yeah, why should they care? And if they don't need to care, why do I even need to learn it? It's like you're looking at a lot of people who have gone through trying to learn something here, and then so what? What did it do for them, right? Do they have any kind of edge? So you're looking for where's the pitch, right? And so on. So that's, let's see. I think a lot of the pitch is just the, the pitch we give for school in general. Speaking of that uh, Cornell West lecture again, um, education, what is the word he kept using for it? Oh, he had a, like a Latin word that he repeated over and over again. Like any other human being, in this case, under Jim Crow apartheid situations. There they sat, nearly 30 of them on the rough benches their faces shading from a pale cream to a deep brown, the little feet bare and swinging, the eyes full of expectation. Oh, that's, I love to be in classes like that. We had that today and this morning and last night. You, know, you walk in, 
eyes of expectation, anticipation. How am I going to learn how to die today? <laughs> oh, Brother Wes, thank you for allowing me to learn how to die better, to scrutinize better, interrogate better, criticize better, so that I can live better, more courageously, more critically, more visionary, more love, more courage, and so forth. See, that process of paideia that we talked about. You gotta watch that again, I'm thinking. Okay, so there's the Mennonites I was talking about. Kind of Sufi-like, and if you've tracked this channel, it's like I'm talking to other uh, private schools all the time. By talking to, I mean, you know, publishing YouTubes and where I say, hey, hey, uh, you know, if you're a private Catholic school, uh, have you considered, for example, uh, bringing in some of this um, concentric hierarchy, hierarchy of polyhedron? If not, why not? You know, let's talk about it. That's the sociology. That's where we could have our, our fun debates, our IQ to the second power. Notice I didn't say squared like that, you know, YouTube channel, right? Like, isn't this interesting enough to merit... Uh, inclusion in any serious sort of university philosophy curriculum at this point, right? Aren't we up to that point? And I think everyone sees the verdict. The verdict is no, and therefore this stuff becomes verboten or off the radar or no. You're not. This is not what to t teach at Stanford, even though the archives is there. This is not what to teach at Stanford. And on that note, look at history for a second. I'm about to wind up here. Uh, I did, uh, when I lived in Bhutan, I wrote something called a Bhutanese mathematics curriculum. I kind of thought of myself as a another Father Mackey, although I was just a guy in his, what, 20, 30s, I guess. Or was I, what, what, when, this was like 84 something. Bhutanese mathematics curriculum, and or maybe it was later than that. I think it was later, 86. Let's check it out in Flickr. So I just watched this Bhutan um, documentary. It's fairly recent. Lots of drone work. Good work. Good work on the drones. That's a place for drones, definitely. Bhutanese. Here we go. Here we are. Uh, 1980s curriculum writing. So this is from from there, but I don't like this. This is a slide of my Bhutanese mathematics curriculum, but I don't label it as such. I don't tag all my photos. It's really oh, that's where I wanted to end up today. You know, Portland has been big in even global news because of what riots and I've been calling them the Joker riots of 2020 because there's a lot of there are, there is a, a a lot of mix in there and uh, I know people could call them other things and I I was thinking I had I have YouTubes where I was addressing that and talking about Portland in that respect and now the reason Portland's in the news is because of why? Because of our weather. Let me just see, though, if I have some more Bhutanese math right here next to each other, right? So I can search chronologically in sequence. If I'm lucky, there's a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, here we go. So there's, I'll, I'll pull some of these up and scroll back through them. So this is stuff I wrote while I was in Bhutan about all of this stuff. But again, if I were a Bhutanese, I would not know what to make of any of this necessarily. I, where is the cross check? 1989. Oh no, that wouldn't have been me. Really? Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, there's some real pages. There we go. Center for Urban Education. That's what I was working with at the time. Anyway, it's just a document. Pretty interesting. I had a laser printer. 
So, yeah, obviously I've been doing a lot to, like, promulgate this. But, okay, here. Um, let's switch it to your videos. So I've been doing all these kind of videos about this kind of stuff for quite some time. So many that if I want to get to the beginning, I have to sort with oldest first because I can't scroll through them all anymore. There's too many, it seems, to just scroll through them all. So starting from the beginning and going forward, there's me in Chicago at one of the Regency, Hyatt Regencies, doing a Python for teachers. And I work all this stuff in all the way back. I came to me to call it Martian Math more recently and give you stories about why I do that. But what I'm looking for is when we do the duel, right, the duel of a polyhedron, this one, Genesis story. I've got 307 views as of right now, according to YouTube. Of course, you can download these. People can pass these around. They could be on a memory stick somewhere. I wouldn't get the count on that, right? So these web analytics are just, you know, they have a narrow definition. But to decode this a little bit, but notice I call it, if you can see down at the bottom, I call it verboten math. That's where I've been coming from before Martian math kind of remarking on how this stuff is so under the radar for some reason, right? So tetrahedron at the center here, its own dual, right? Let me just blow this up, take over the screen. And then paired on either side of the tetrahedron, you can like even build the cube with the two tetrahedron, right? So dual tet cube, C for cube, that's the volume three in the, the concentric hierarchy, its dual is octahedron 4, and then you've got the icosahedron paired with the dual of that, the pentagonal dodecahedron. Now it's when these duals combine with each other, their edges will be crisscross at 90 degrees, and when you combine, say, the cube with the octahedron, its dual, what do you get? Rhombic dodecahedron. That's our volume 6, recall. And these two, icosahedron and pentagonal dodecahedron combined, dual combined, you could say, is the operation, kind of addition in a way, to become the rhombic tricondahedron. And I symbolize these two with their respective rhombs, right? Their lozenges, or whatever we call them. And remember how the RT fits into the concentric hierarchy in many places, right? where it's just the additive sum of the jitterbug icosahedron. Now you're, I'm losing a lot of you, but for those of you who've been hanging on, the 18.51 icosahedron combined with its uh, dual gives you what I'll call the super RT. It's the RT that's phi scaled up from the one that shrink wraps a CCP ball. So you take that that's uh, 5 plus RT, little more than 5 volume, tetra volume, scale it up by 5, and it meets up with the vertices of the jitterbug icosa and its dual. And then with the rhombic dodecahedron, that exactly shrink wraps a uh, CCP ball as well, and it actually close packs, and it is the foundation of what we call the IVM which stands sort of next to XYZ as an alternative scaffolding. You could say that's the Martian math, collaboration, XYZ. There's a way to go back and forth. These odd volumes I'm giving you, like one for the tetrahedron, imply a conversion constant as if there were two currencies and you're going back and forth. And indeed, that's what we're doing. So I call that verboten. And I got it connected to Washington High School. There's a story there and connected with actually Occupy. Because it's kind of a, it's the outsider, kind of marginalized people, it seems, who have some awareness of Smedley Butler and the business plot and the kind of stuff I talk about, leading to the story we're telling here, which is where if you are on... Um, you could say the side of America's major futurists, Medal of Freedom winner, and so on, 
uh, you are in a way a subversive because you're teaching stuff that's not in any of the so-called public schools. You got to come to a private school like this. Weird, huh? But it is in the literature and you can find it all and it is cross-checked and corroborated. It's just very esoteric at this point in history. And that's, if you're into esoterica, come on over. Come on out over and check it out. And you will find that there are other schools of thought out there that are making at least some use, some use of the concentric hierarchy. And you may know of more, and you may want to let me know, and you may want to collaborate. You may want to say, well, I know Kirby, you're a Quaker, and I'm something else, but hey, we, we can animate these, these uh, cartoons or whatever. We can make these uh, co-productions, or I can get your advice, you can get mine, whatever. So yeah, I'm all out, all, all out there collaborating already with some people. And I look forward to, <coughs> excuse me, doing more of that. But you guys don't have to wait for me, is what I'm saying. It's important geometry that you could build some kind of niche for yourself. <coughs> and as you do so, more people will notice, and there'll be more cross-checking of this, and people will say, hey, it is a legitimate subculture that we should in good conscience, include when we study, say, American history or whatever we study. All right, well, I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to get to <clears throat> today. And I hope you have a good rest of your, uh, oh, where Portland is right now. That was my final thing. Back to Photo's dream. We are in the middle of fire season. And so the air quality here, again, global headlines, is supposedly the worst for any city in the world right now. In the world. And this is Hawthorne. It was that the smoke was super high up. It wasn't coming right down the street. But now we are submer submerged. This guy's just kicked back with his hammock. Uh, it wasn't that blurry. That was me trying to take a picture in the middle of the street kind of stupidly so the camera wasn't uh, steady. But I just wanted to give a picture of... I'm taking pictures of the sky and it's my camera may even compensate and say, wait a minute, that can't be right and put some blue in it. But it's really pretty orange, really. I'm trying to get a, give you a sense of what Portland, Oregon looks like tonight atmospherically or last night, and here we are in the morning, next day, and it looks pretty much the same, right? This is how it looks. The sun is just a pink dot. Okay, so, and that's because of fires. Lots of fires. Dry conditions, high winds. All right, talk to you soon.